Morning, everybody. Nothing like having a bishop in Jesus for your warm-up act. <laughs> no pressure. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would be powerfully present in this room right now. That I would say only those things that you desire me to say. And that they would be like an arrow to pierce the hearts of those of us who are most in need this morning of hope. Father, just as Jonathan said a moment ago, we too now surrender ourselves again to you. We give you permission to do whatever you desire in our lives, and especially at this time. So let my words be like fire. And bring warmth and light and hope to those of us who need it the most. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, just a quick word. This is not a talk. I always find it really helpful to say that. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm a priest, so I don't give talks. Um, It's intended to be a word. So I I say that mainly because the title of this has changed uh, three times. It's not the beauty of surrender anymore. It's the beauty of hope. Um, I'm not sure if we can see this. Oh, nope, I want to go back. So, um, This is a a very famous icon. Some of you might be familiar with it, maybe some of you not. I want to explain it really quickly because I believe that what we're looking at right here, and if you know icons, icons are supposed to be windows. They're not not drawings. They're actually, they're they're technically said they're written, and you, they're, they're means by which we enter into the mystery. This is the mystery of Jesus liberating hell. This is where some of us are right now. And it's certainly where much of the world is right now. And it's where some of our family members are right now. Jesus is the one in the center, obviously, holding the cross. He's standing on Satan's head. This has happened, people. He's crushed him. He's broken the gates of hell. And you see hands that are stretched out to him. He's he's bringing out of hell, out of darkness, out of anxiety, out of sadness, out of despair, out of emptiness, out of meaninglessness. He's bringing those who are caught in those places. That's some of us who are here right now. It is, again, certainly much of the world, and unfortunately, it's much of the church, too. And we believe this is what the Lord wants to have happen here. So we want to speak about the beauty of hope. This is the enduring image we want to leave everybody with. It's a storm. And it is indeed rough out there right now. The waves are violent. The winds are strong. It's loud. It seems chaotic. It's tempting to think everything, whether it's on a worldwide scale or a national scale or The church is just kind of spinning out of control. But it's it's not just rough out, out there, it's rough in the church too. It's rough inside here. It's rough in here. We're we're really good at putting up facades. How you doing? I'm well, thanks. Was that a hello or did you really want to know how I'm doing? And the Lord, in the midst of these storms that you and I and the world and the church are going through right now, he wants to speak to us. Our our work, we describe ourselves in in many different ways, but this is our team, Acts 29. If if you all know the Bible, you know there is no Acts 29, or actually better put, you and I are Acts 29, which is to say that the Holy Spirit who wrote the first 28 chapters of the Acts of the Apostles is writing right now the next chapter of the church through you and through me. And we describe ourselves in lots of ways, but maybe most especially as missionaries of hope. 
And there are many needs in the church right now, but that's one of the most pressing ones we believe. We need hope. Not optimism. Hope. Paul says in his second letter to his friend Timothy, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I want you to linger for a moment with that word correction, because I think that's what the Lord wants to do this morning. We could also translate that word as straightening up again, making something that's lame whole, or, or putting us back on our feet to stay with the image of the sea, something like giving us our sea legs again. So that's, that's the image here. Something's been bent, and the Lord wants to bend it back. And for many of us, what's bent is our hope. I run into people over and over again in the church who are exceedingly anxious. Don't be anxious. And so what, what I want to do is I just want to linger with you, if I can, through five scriptural texts. If, if my words are not effective, if nothing else, I pray that the word of God will be. And that we can linger on these together. And, and these are the texts. And you know them all well. <laughs> I'm just going to put the texts up. You have to memorize them. John 12, 32. Philippians 4, 6. Luke 11, 22. Colossians 2, 15. And Hebrews 6, 19 to 20. So let's reflect on these and ask the Lord to walk us through these days. So first, John 12. Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, then I will draw all people to myself. That's what we want to do right now. We want to lift Jesus up. We want to ask him to help us to see him as he is. There is an urgent need for us for so many reasons to ever better understand who Jesus is. It's one of the reasons why Jonathan is so powerful as a witness to Jesus in The Chosen. He has given us an image of Jesus, which is at one and the same time very easy to relate to, and as Bishop Barron said, is clearly more than a man. He's human, but he's so much more. We desperately need to see Jesus. And one of the reasons we need to see him is because He's intimately connected with this theme of hope. So take a moment right now and, and, and just think for your, to yourself, how do you see Jesus? If you were to describe him with a word, what would the word be? Just think about that for a moment. Because oftentimes we find people say things like, well, he's kind. And he is, or he's compassionate, and he is, or he's merciful, and he is, or he's gentle, and he is. But is that all he is? Or is there more to Jesus than those attributes? We're going to come back to those. Let's move to the second text where St. Paul says to the, the church in Philippi and to you and me right now at this very real moment in history, in the church and in our country, have no anxiety about anything. That's a command. Do not be anxious about anything. Is that you? I feel rather convicted by that. <laughs> Have no anxiety about anything. Ours is a culture that's not just riddled with anxiety, it's riddled with despair. Many of us are probably familiar. Uh, Mitch Album, who's a syndicated columnist, he writes out of Detroit, he published an article a little bit over three years ago right now which this was the title of it, Why is Living Shorter and Dying Sooner a New Trend? And in this article, he relates what a, a number of sociologists have come across in, over the last number of years, which is a really jarring statistic, which is that life expectancy in the United States of America for the first time in 100 years declined for three consecutive years. 
This was back in 2018. The last time that happened was 1918, and what was happening in 1918 was the end of World War I and the Spanish flu, which killed 50 million people. We're not living through a world war right now, and we don't have a pandemic like the Spanish flu, as real as COVID was and is. We're dying right now because we're losing the will to live. You know what the second leading cause for children between the ages of 10 and 14 is in our country? Suicide. We're 5% of the world's population. We consume 80% of the world's opioids. Cirrhosis of the liver, especially amongst young men ages 25 to 34, is off the chart. The mental health crisis that's going on in our country, which we have not even begun to unpack with COVID, is through the roof. Anybody in here who's either a priest or a counselor or a therapist or just lends an ear to somebody who's in trouble knows this. We are exceedingly anxious. This is a culture that has literally no hope because hope is a specifically Christian virtue. If you do not know who God is and you do not know what Jesus has done, then you don't have any hope. And we don't think most people do know who God is in our work. And we don't think most people know what Jesus has done. Pope John Paul II once said in a, in a letter that he wrote, he says, the, the ardent proclamation of the gospel is supposed to be such that a person, when they hear it, is gradually overwhelmed and then moved to a place where they make a decision to surrender their entire lives to Jesus in faith. I would challenge anybody to go to any parish anywhere in the country and right after the gospel is proclaimed, just stand up and say, hey, can I just ask for a quick show of hands here? How many of you have been overwhelmed by the gospel? How many hands do you think would go up? Then a follow-up question. How many people here have made a decision to surrender everything they have, just like Jonathan said? My time, my money, my body, my talents, everything, my life to Jesus in faith. And you'd be doing one of these. Is there anybody out there? Right? And we think the reason for that is we don't think most people have ever heard the gospel. But anxiety isn't just something that's out there. It's in here or in her, too. And just like the bishop said, the church has, there's never been an ideal age, right? Never. If, if you think that way, you know, Augustine used to say, did you guys forget the flood? <laughs> Do you remember what happened when we got kicked out of Eden? How about Sodom and Gomorrah? There's no, there's no golden era to long for. And this is the era that God has created us to live in. So what might you and I be anxious about right now? (laughs) Ukraine, elections, family members, our own health. Countless things, right? But to be honest, why was our hope in any of those things to begin with? Our hope should only be in God. Only in God. Maybe, maybe, the last couple of years have been for a lot of us an experience of God and His kindness, kind of like a severe mercy, exposing our idols. I don't know about you, I used to read the Old Testament and I thought, man, what a bunch of morons. Like, how do you bow down to a, to a stone that you made or an uh, an object that you made until I came across a, a line from Timothy Keller. You might know Keller. He's a, a reformed Presbyterian minister in New York who's a great preacher. He defines an idol as anything that's more important to you than God. Ugh. <laughs> like anything that you look to give you what only God can give you. Anything which, should you lose it, would mean that life would seem hardly worth living. And suddenly I'm aware of the fact that I have lots of idols. And God in his kindness wants to expose those. 
So this is a, this is a great time, I believe, we believe, in our work for something like a level set from God. A chance to, to dive deeply into how it is and why it is that Paul could say, not just to the Philippians, but to you and me, have no anxiety about anything. So let's move on to these next two scriptures to understand what helps to form Paul's attitude. Jesus says in a very enigmatic parable in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, after he drives out a demon, a really important text. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, well, then he takes away his armor in which he trusted and he divides the spoils. This text gives us a summary of both what we would call the bad news and the good news. It would be our conviction that one of the reasons why most people do not experience the gospel as good news is because we don't talk enough about the bad news, and the bad news, people, is horrific. The bad news is there is a strong man. His name is Satan. He's very real. He's a creature. He's no rival to God. He's a creature, but he's infinitely more powerful than you and I are. And out of envy of the plan that God has for you and for me, he deceived our first parents way back at the history or the beginning of our history into unknowingly and stupidly selling our race into slavery to powers that you and I can't compete against. Namely, the power of sin and the power of death. And on our own, there is nothing we can do to get out of them. This whole country, and indeed the world, and many of us here this morning, are terrified of dying. Jesus wants to liberate us from that. But that's not the ending of the parable. That's just the bad news. Here's the good news, the extraordinary good news. Jesus goes on to say, when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, well then, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and he divides his spoil. That's Jesus, people. Jesus is the stronger one. Jesus is the one who attacks Satan. It's why he came. I want to break that down a little bit further, but let me do that by way of another text, our fourth text from St. Paul. Paul says that he, this is, he's talking about Jesus here, he disarmed, or we might more literally translate that, that Greek word into he, he despoiled the rulers and the authorities. Who are the rulers and the authorities? Death, sin, hell, and Satan, most especially. He put them to open shame, or we might more literally translate that word as he stripped them naked, triumphing over them in him or in his cross. Now, this is a text which, I don't know what you think when you read this text. I mean, like, triumph for me is, I don't know what it is, but triumph for Paul and for everybody that Paul was writing to was very clear. A triumph was a very particular word which was used in the Roman Empire. It was held on the occasion, usually of the Roman emperor, coming into town after winning a fierce battle. This is a triumph. This is Caesar coming into Rome in his chariot, surrounded by his soldiers, and he's, this is, in this case, this is the Julius Caesar after he has defeated the king of Gaul. Keep this image up, please. This is Jesus. This is the imagery Paul's using. He's playing on a scene which was very familiar to his listeners. In this very real historical moment, Ju Julius Caesar, after eight years of having battled the king of Gaul, comes riding into town as the overwhelming victor. 
And behind him are the spoils, all the people that he's captured. And most especially, at the end of the line is the king of Gaul in chains, helpless, defeated, usually with a sign above his head, which says something like, this is the one who has threatened and tyrannized us. He will do that no more. That's how Paul understands Jesus. This is Jesus, people. <laughs> For real, we just happen to have a man uh, who's been with us and who's helped us to see him, but it's really important that we understand that Jesus is not just kind. He's not just gentle. He's not just compassionate. He's not just merciful. He is all of those, or we would all be toast, right? But he's not just those. Jesus is the one through whom the universe was made. And if you're not aware of how big the universe is, the universe is 90 plus billion light years across. That's 90 billion times 5.88 trillion miles across. That's 522 sextillion miles across. That's 522 with 22 zeros after it. That's who Jesus is. He's the one through whom and for whom all of that was made. Jesus is the one who has no match. Sin is no match for him. He's canceled it. God has a cancel culture too. <laughs> he really does. The great news is what God cancels is sin, not people. You want to know the proof of that? How do you know that Peter denied Jesus? Who told us that? Someone said the Gospels. Who told the people who wrote the Gospels? Peter did. Peter told them. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> it was the most painful, humiliating moment of my life. But you know what? As painful and as humiliating as it was, it doesn't define me. It's not who I am. The Lord forgave that. That's God's version of a cancel culture. Sin is no match for Jesus. Death is no match for Jesus. He's abolished it. There are people right now in this room who are afraid of dying. People, you don't have to be afraid of dying. It's going to happen. Like, prepare for it. Might be tomorrow. It's going to be soon, in the relative term of soon. Don't be afraid of it. It can't hold you. It's just a door through which we pass to the other side where our friends and family are even now awaiting us, where the Lord himself is waiting for us. You don't have to be afraid of dying. That's why Francis can call it sister death. Satan is no match for Jesus. He has bound him. Yes, he's still prowling like a roaring lion, as Peter tells us, but he's lost and he knows it. Jesus is not Satan's rival. Michael is. That's why we pray the prayer to St. Michael. Satan cowers in fear at the name of Jesus because he knows he has been defeated by him. There is no match for Jesus. He has no rival. Jesus is absolutely and utterly people, unconquerable. He's Lord. And I'm afraid that when we hear that or we say that, we think that's the mere ending of a prayer. It's not. It's a reality. To say Jesus is Lord is to say nobody else is. It's just him, the world, this country, 
the church, your parish, your family, your life is firmly in his hands. That's the good news. This, this is not to be naive or optimistic. I'm kind of Eeyore by temperament. That's my nature. It's beautiful right now. It's probably going to snow tomorrow here. Who knows? <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic in the least. A priest friend of mine says, it's going to get worse before it gets worse. <laughs> and I think he's right. I think it's, maybe we get a Marian apparition here. Who knows? It's happened before. But if we don't, I think it's going to be very hard to live as a Christian in the United States of America. But so what? I mean, so what, really? He's Lord. Death has been conquered. Satan has been bound. Sin has been canceled. I do not need to be afraid. Right now, Jesus is not nervous. Let that linger with you for a second. (laughs) For real. Jesus isn't nervous. Nothing is spinning out of control right now. He's, God's not looking down going, oh my gosh, like, what the are they doing? <laughs> are you nervous? Let me share with you, if I can, a, a, a quote from, I don't know if you've, any of you have come across this. If you're looking for something great to read, it's, a, it's, it's not so much a book, it's more like an extended little essay. It's called From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Some friends of ours wrote it. Leave this up if you wouldn't mind, please. This is, this is a scene that the authors are trying to get us to imagine what it would be like in the first century at the very first evangelization committee meeting. God forbid. And so this is the agenda. Bring the gospel of Jesus to the world. So they're all sitting down. Here's the 12. They're like, okay, let's, let's figure out how to do this. Like, this is the challenge. Like, go evangelize the world. Okay, let's look what we got. Bishops, we got, uh, well, we got 11 of them. All right. Priests, how many of those? Uh, same, same number. Uh, deacons, uh, what's a deacon? We don't have any of those yet. Trained theologians like Bishop Barron. No, we don't have any of those. How about some religious orders? Mm -mm, None of those either. Seminaries, none. Seminarians, necessarily so, none. How about Christian believers? We got a couple of hundred. Great. Countries with Christians in them. Hmm. One. Uh, (laughs) Church buildings, no. Schools, no, none of those. Written gospels, nope, not yet. Money, uh, not much. Experience in missions, uh, zip. Influential contexts. Uh, almost zip. Societal attitude toward us, ignorant to hostile. (laughs) This is the situation of the church in the first century. For real. Listen to what the authors go on to say. If the apostles had been thinking from the standpoint of the strength of existing Christian institutions, they would have been overwhelmed by discouragement facing crises in every direction, vocational, financial, catechetical, educational, and numerical. This is, in my experience, where many of us in the church are right now. We're overwhelmed by discouragement. It often seems like we're managing decline. I, I come from the Archdiocese of Detroit. We have over a million Catholics. You know how many priests we ordained this year? Zero. Zero. When I was ordained 26 years ago, we had twice the number of priests that we have now. In five years, we'll have half the number of priests that we have now. In five years, we'll have 25% of the priests that we had in the Archdiocese of Detroit as when I was ordained. It's leading many people to be discouraged. But here's what the authors go on to say. But they weren't discouraged. They were filled with joy and with hope. They had great confidence in their Lord, in their message, and in the creativity and fertility of the church. They knew that their task was to be used by the Holy Spirit to grow the church 
And they knew that grace means by which it was to grow, and did it grow. The church in a time like ours right now needs to have the same confidence in the power and the goodness of the message she bears. We might say with this conference, in the beauty of the message which she bears, in its life-changing potency, in the church's power of regeneration and growth. In a particular way, those in positions of influence and authority need to be convinced that Christ is the answer to every human ill, the solution to every human problem, the only hope for a dying race. They need to be convinced of the bad news, that the human race has, by its own rebellion, brought a curse upon itself and has sold itself into slavery to the prince of darkness, and that there is nothing we can do on our own power to save ourselves. But we need to be equally convinced of the good news, that God, in his mercy, has come among us to set us free from our sins and from slavery to the devil. And for those who turn to their true allegiance, the nightmare of life apart from God can be transformed into a dawn of eternal hope. They need to know from their own experience that obedience to the gospel is perfect freedom, that holiness leads to happiness, that a world without God is a desolate wasteland, And that new life in Christ transforms darkness into light. Let me just ask you, is that your attitude? Would you like it to be? (laughs) Where does that come from? That attitude. It comes from faith. How do we get faith? Faith comes from hearing, Paul says. Hearing the proclamation of the gospel. This morning is really just a big teaser for a breakout that we're going to do this afternoon where we want to share that with you. But by God's grace, we believe that he's allowed us to be part of um, what we're now seeing as a, a global movement called the Rescue Project, which is something that he's led us to create, which we're just giving away for free. We want to share it with you uh, and talk to you a little bit about it this afternoon. You can come right back in here at 2.45. That's the end of the commercial. (laughs) But when that happens, when we hear the gospel, when, as John Paul says, we're overwhelmed by the extraordinary, explosive, life-changing message of what God has done for us in Jesus, namely how he's bound the strong man, crushed the power of death, canceled our sins, reconciled us to the Father, showed us beyond the shadow of a doubt that you matter to God, so much so that he became man and did all that he did. When that happens, when the attitude that was the apostle's attitude can be ours, and we, like Paul, can have no anxiety about anything, which brings me to our fifth scripture. Hebrews says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Right now, at this very moment, if you want to know what Jesus is doing right now, Hebrews tells us right now. Jesus is interceding for you and for me by name before the Father. And and that reality gives us hope, and hope is like an anchor. How do anchors work? Anchors work by lodging into something. Hope, Hope is an objective reality. It has nothing to do with how I feel. I don't feel very hopeful. But hope is an objective reality. It's rooted in something. It's rooted in what God has done for us. Our our, our hope is lodged in the concrete historical fact 
that God who made this universe, which is so massive, out of love, just out of love, because grace always goes first, has entered into the world to do something about the mess that we made of it. That's why our hope is firm. And no matter how turbulent the the cultural or the ecclesial or the personal waters may become in the future, because of that hope which is lodged into the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that he is right now at this very moment interceding for me and for you before the Father, I don't have to be tossed to and fro from the waves. So let me linger with you with one final scripture. As we were praying about gathering with everybody, this was the word that we felt like the Lord in a particular way wanted us to linger with. And I'm going to ask you just to keep this text and this image on the screen for us. Because I think this is happening right now in every one of our lives in one way or another. This is the passage in Matthew 8. You remember when Jesus, uh, he tells the disciples, get into the boat, let's go to the other side. And behold, a a great storm on the sea arose. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee is is about 13 miles by 7 miles. It's It's a big lake. And it's notorious for violent storms that come out of nowhere. And the word that Paul uses, or that Matthew uses here rather, for storm, in Greek it's the word seismos. You know, seismograph, it measures an earthquake. This isn't like it's the wind picked up. This is a violent earthquake that's happening as the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. And the boat was being swamped by the waves. The, the imagery that Matthew's creating here is it's as if the boat's getting baptized. They're covered by the waves. Much like that image of the church is covered by the waves that we had up earlier. And he's asleep. This is a reality for many of us in here right now. We're in a boat. It's very stormy. And Jesus, we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe he was in, wasn't in the boat. But man, he seems to be sleeping. And so they go to wake him up. And this is how it's, you know, this is how we usually read it at Mass. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord. (laughs) We're ruined. (laughs) Do you think that's how they said that to him? (laughs) Uh, Pardon me, uh, Lord, but uh, we're about to die here. (laughs) And if you could do something, it would be very valuable. (laughs) In Greek, it's three words. Lord, save, lost. That's where some of us are right now. Lord, save. I'm lost. And this is how I pray with this scene. So I, as, I, as I pray with this, I picture, you know, Jesus is in the back of the boat, and John's next to him, because John's always next to him. He's the beloved, so, you know, <laughs> deal with it. And, and Peter's in the front of the boat. And so if you've ever been in the middle of a storm, like, you can't have a conversation with somebody. You know, like, you, you have to yell, right? Imagine being in 50-mile-an-hour winds. You've got waves that are hitting the boat. You've got, you know, the sound of the oars. You've got a lot of noise. You can't just have a conversation. You have to scream. So John is, like, shaking Jesus, going, Save! Lord! Lost! And Peter's up at the front of the boat. And Peter can't hear what's going on. He just sees John trying to shake him. And Jesus looks at him, and Jesus has the nerve to say this. Hey, uh, what's the problem? (laughs) And so I picture, you know, Peter's over here, and he's like, what did he say? And John's back here, and John's like, he wants to know why we're afraid. (laughs) And Peter says, you got to be kidding me. And we laugh, but right now, in the middle of whatever storm you're going through,
getting old, dreading that doctor's report, fearful of your children who've wandered away from the church, concerned about the state of the church, worried about the election a week from tomorrow, whatever it is that's going on in your life, in the middle of this boat, which is rocking up and down, in the midst of unbelievably turbulent waters and so much noise going on inside your head, you can hardly think. Jesus asks you and me the same question. What's the problem? Why are you afraid? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know what I can do? Don't you know that the church is right here in my hands? Don't you know that your marriage is right here in my hands? Don't you know that your life is not in the hands of doctors? It's not in the hands of treatment. It's not in the hands of diagnosis. It's in my hands. And no one can take you out of my hands because I'm Lord and there is no other. And I'm not just Lord. I love you. I don't love y'all. I just love you. And I see you right now with all your anxiety and all your fear and all your worry. I see you. And it's okay. Not because I'm just going to magically make all the problems go away. Life here is like being in a boat in a very violent storm, always. But I'm in the boat with you. And I promised you that I would give you peace, not as the world gives, I told you. The world only knows peace when there's absence of conflict. Good luck with that. My peace comes in the middle of conflict. My peace comes in the middle of the storm. My peace comes when you're sitting there in the waiting room. My peace comes when you're at the bedside of someone that you love who's leaving this world. My peace comes in the middle of results, whether they're on a national or a local scale, that we don't like. My peace can penetrate Auschwitz. That's what I'm offering you right now, he says. And that, my friends, is really, truly beautiful. Here's Jesus. I see people with phones often. I want to encourage you, if you've got your phone, take a picture of this image. This has become a favorite image of us or of ours. I I particularly love the fact that Jesus is facing the storm. Whatever storm in your life, this this is what's happening right now. He's addressing it. And if you remember in this, the gospel passage, this Lord, the one who made the universe, after he says to the apostles and to us, why are you so afraid? Then with just a word, he says to the sea, Shh. 
Because the sea is his creature, and it knows its master's voice, and it just becomes calm. And the apostles look at each other and go, who in the world is this who speaks to the elements and they listen? (laughs) Well, that would be God. And God has done all of this for us. So that in the midst of all these crazy things that are going on, you and I can, even now at this very moment, walk out of this room today, go back home to our lives with unshakable confidence in Him. I'm not confident in the leaders of the church, no offense to Bishop Barron. (laughs) I'm not confident in the leaders of the world. I'm not confident in the leaders of our country or my state. I don't have to be. They're not in charge. He's in charge. And so we don't have to be afraid. So let's ask the Holy Spirit right now to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, your Son said that when he was lifted up from the earth, he would draw every person to himself. So I ask, Father, in a way that only you can, right now, in this place, that you would lift up before us who Jesus is. Those of us who need to be reminded that he is kind, overwhelm us with his kindness. Help us to know that he knows us by name and calls us by name even though he knows our sin. For those of us who need to know that his grace is sufficient for all things, do that now, Father, we ask by your Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Help us to know that we don't have to be strong. He does, and He is. For those of us who are afraid because of circumstances, remind us that life is not in the hands of circumstances. Life is in your hands. History is His story. No one's in the hands of circumstances. For those of us who need to know that he's conquered death because of our facing our own impending death or the death of a loved one or the recent loss of a loved one, help us to know that he's conquered it. He's abolished it. It has no power over us. For those of us who are anxious, discouraged, shaken, fearful, Father, replace all of that with childlike trust, with hope like an anchor lodged into the foot of the cross, immovable, unshakable, never to be tossed to and fro. Father, throughout this day, throughout these days, Continue to keep Jesus lifted high in front of us. Holy Spirit, help us to know him, to know him as Lord, as friend, as the lover of our souls, who out of that great love has shown us the Father's unfathomable delight in us, and has gone to war to rescue us from those horrific powers that on our own we could never face. Father, we love you. We adore you. We thank you that all that we're talking about in these days is true. You are the beautiful one. And to behold your Son 
on the cross and triumphantly risen from the dead pleases. It's truly beautiful. And He and you and the Spirit are our only hope. So catapult us out from this place into a world which is frightened, anxious, angry, despairing, and without hope. And let us be joyful and attractive witnesses of the difference that Jesus and He alone makes. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.